Uh, so right now what I'd like to do is welcome everyone to our uh, symposium on the worldwide impact of uh, uh, potato cyst nematodes. Uh, this symposium is sponsored by both the Biological Control Committee as well as the Global Era Alliance, which is a USDA NEFA uh, funded uh, coordinated agricultural project. It's a five-year project to understand population genetics of uh, Globadera, as well as develop resistance in U.S. potato to uh, Globadera pallida and Globadera rostockiensis. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, speaker Inga Zasada, who's going to talk about the current status of Globadera infestation in the U.S. All right, thank you and good morning. Um, so my talk is kind of to set the stage uh, for what's going on in the United States and kind of the, the status of what's going on in the United States and what kind of justified a five-year project that's funded by NEFA on Globet Air in the United States. I want to acknowledge my co-authors who are the heads of the Globet Air programs in their respective states, and that is Louise Marie Dandran, who's head of the Pale Cyst Nematode Program at the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho, and Zhaohang Wang, who is with USDA ARS and is in charge of the nematology part of the Rostockiensis program in New York. So a lot of the content you'll see has come from them as well as my project in Oregon on Globet Air at Alentone. Okay, just a quick outline, um, why do we care? And then I'm gonna go through the three different Globet era infestations that we have in the United States. I'll finish off by telling you a little bit more about the Globet era Alliance and then some conclusions. Oh, I'm sorry. And these are the nematodes we're talking about down here on the bottom. Globet era Rostockiensis, so the golden nematode in New York, the pale cyst nematode of Globet era pallida in Idaho, and Globet era Ellingtone, a newly described Globet era that is, occurs in Idaho and Oregon. So the importance of PCN is kind of preaching to the choir here. Um, we all know that Globideras are uh, native to South America in the Andes region and that they spread throughout the world on seed potato pieces, more recently with global commerce. Um, they're quarantine pests in most countries. Uh, potato is the third most important food crop globally, so when you consider that there have been reports of up to 80% yield lost by this group of nematodes, you understand the importance of it. And these are some classic pictures of the type of above ground symptoms you'll see with uh, Globadera infestation on potato. Just quickly, the life cycle, and to point out some of the biological features of this nematode that make it important. Um, juveniles hatch from eggs that are contained in cysts. Uh, these nematodes tend to have very narrow host ranges and only hatch in response to specific cues, so that makes it more successful. It, it sits around and it waits for an appropriate host to be present. Uh, here are females developing on roots. These will eventually die, become encysted, and contain four to 500 eggs. So the most challenging part of this life cycle, as you all know, are, are that cysts can remain viable in soil for decades. So once you have an introduction, that introduction can stay around for decades. So coming back to the United States, where is Globadera found? And I want, I'm going to continuously emphasize this in my talk, that we have a very limited introduction. And John Pickup is going to probably touch on this some more. But really, the amount of acreage in the United States that's impacted by Globadera is minimal. We have Rostockiensis in New York, Pallida in Idaho, and Globadera Ellingtone in Oregon and Idaho. And just to present it in a different way, we have three Globaderas. Uh, they're geographically distributed. Two are regulated pests, one is not. And the way that we're approaching their management or eradication differs from location and location, and I'll go through that as well. And then finally, <clears throat> you know, Globadera is a big, a big deal for the uh, U.S. potato industry. We have a $4 billion potato industry. Idaho, where Globadera pallida is found, is the largest potato producer in the United States with 300,000 acres in production. And I just put this up here because it's another point that really kind of demonstrates why we're having a problem with Globadera pallida in Idaho. And that's the fact that 91% of the acreage is producing russeted type potatoes. And we do not have Globadera pallida resistance in an accepted commercial variety of russets, okay? 
And that's in contrast with New York, which produces primarily white varieties. Um, and there's been an active breeding program to incorporate Rostockius, Rostockiensis re resistance into these varieties. In Oregon, where I'm from, we're also a resident type um, state. And then just for comparison, North Dakota has a more diverse potato production system. So we do have quite a bit of diversity in our production system in the United States. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the three different nematodes, uh, tell you a little bit about them. And if we are all good nematologists, then we have heard the classic story of Guevara rostockiensis in New York. Um, it was introduced in the 1930s, probably on equipment coming back from World War II. It took two decades uh, for this nematode to reach uh, detectable levels. Um, as we all know, cysts will come in. You might have a few cysts. You need multiple susceptible crops for that population to reach a level that's detectable. So that's what happened in New York. Uh, 30 fields were initially found. Um, and these are some of those classic pictures that we've all seen of the yield impact that golden, uh, the golden nematode can have on potato. This is a map of the current infestation in New York. And again, it's very limited, it's contained. Um, the red areas are regulated areas in New York. So the evolution of the Globidera Rostockiensis program in the United States, and this is important as well, it started off as an eradication program with applications of DD and 1,3-D. Okay, so initially, that's how the U.S. wanted to respond to this. They wanted to eradicate this nematode from the United States. Unfortunately, in the late 60s, additional fields in western New York were found, and there was a shift in the program uh, to the use of non-volatile nematicides and plant resistance. Uh, this continued for about 10, 15 years. Uh, nematicides were found in groundwater, resulted in the discontinuation of 1,3-D and TEMIC in these locations. And the focus changed again, and this time to ro rotation and resistant cultivars. Um, in 1994, um, a different pathotype of Rostockiensis was found. Originally it was RO1, all of a sudden RO2 was found, and the breeding program expanded to develop resistance in white table uh, or chipping type potatoes to Globidera Rostockiensis pathotype 1 and 2. So this is the current scheme that's used in New York. Um, and just briefly, um, infested field is found grow a resistant cultivar in two years, surveys are done. Uh, APHIS does, um, has very well established um, uh, tests to look at viability, uh, to take um, samples through bioacid to ensure that soils are free of cyst nematodes. So once no viable cysts are found, they enter a rotation program, and this is a four-year rotation that combines resistant cultivars with either a fallow or a non-host and susceptible cultivars. So this is what's happening in New York right now with impacted fields. And it's been successful, you know, it's been a 60-year program and it, it is a model of success. It's been a cooperative program, um, a very productive research cooperation exists between USDA, ARS, and Cornell University. Um, the goals of which are to develop cultivars, develop new control strategies, and obviously Zhao Hong Wang's program on understanding more about Globidera rostockiensis parasitism. Um, from a regulatory, regulatory perspective, uh, USDA, APHIS, and the New York Department of Ag um, cooperate on this to continue to do soil surveys and monitoring of the problem in New York. USDA, APHIS also provides growers with the equipment they need to be able to um, sanitize and sterilize equipment so that they can continue to contain that introduction in New York to a very small area. So successes over the six years, or excuse me, 60 years, um, over a million soil samples have been examined. Uh, the quarantine area has been reduced by 76% over this period of time. Um, it's the first program in the world to successful, successfully deregulate a field. So this means that it was probably treated with nematicide at some point, went through resistant cultivars. Cysts were deemed as non-viable. They went through a bioassay. There were no eggs that could reproduce on potato, and so it came out of regulation. So that's a big success for this program. I, another big success is are that 20 potato varieties have been released with resistance to Globidera rostockiensis, and there is an active research program in the United States. Okay, moving on to Globidera pallida in Idaho. More recent uh, find in 2006, we're in Quebec, and I was speaking with Russ Bullock yesterday, and rostockiensis was found in Quebec in 2006 as well, uh, but they were completely independent occurrences that just happened to occur at the same time. Uh, in 2006, uh, 
Palladin was found in tear soil as part of routine APHIS surveys. Um, it took 45 days to track this find from the tear dirt to the fields that were infested. Seven fields were found and 911 acres were put under quarantine immediately. Uh, this find uh, resulted in immediate closing of borders to U.S. and Idaho potatoes, uh, most of which have reopened with the exception of Japan, I believe, still does not accept potatoes from Idaho. Um, and I have down here at the bottom a, sur uh, a study that was done on, done on the economic impact of Palada in Idaho. So it was pretty big. And, you know, when you meet with the growers from Idaho that are impacted by this nematode, you really feel sorry for them because they really are losing a lot of money because of this nematode. Uh, 19 infested fields have been found to date. Um, in total in the program, 55,000 acres have been under regulation. When I talk about regulation, I mean fields that actually have the nematode that are infested, and those are, that are called associated fields. So maybe a tractor or an implement went from that infested field to another field, so they're called associated. And currently, <clears throat> there are about 10,000 acres that are regulated, and around 3,000 of these are infested. So that's, again, a very limited infestation. Here it is in uh, north, uh, excuse me, southeast Idaho. It's about a five-mile radius where this nematode occurs and this map shows you the regulated areas. So less than 1% of the Idaho uh, potato production acreage. The program, it was implemented in 2007. It's about a $7 million a year program. So to date, about $70 million has been set on, spent on Palada in Idaho. Here's the goals of the program. They're very similar to what we saw in New York. Uh, prevent sped, um, delimit the infestation. Again, eradication is the goal right now with Palada and Idaho. Very similar to what happened 60 years ago in New York. So that's really not any different. Um, restore foreign markets, mostly that has happened and preserve current markets. So this is what's happened in Idaho between 2007 and 14 from an eradication perspective. Use of methyl bromide with 1,3-D. Uh, some alternatives have been tried to eradication, biofumigation, and currently we have Solanum sesimbrifolium in a few of the uh, impacted fields in Idaho. And the most recent thing that's happened in the program is that in 2015, the use of methyl bromide fumigation was discontinued. Again, a cooperative program that's, that's happening in Idaho. The research program, uh, which is led by Louise Marie, involves University of Idaho and various ARS partners. Uh, their goals are to develop integrated eradication strategies, develop a rusted type potato with resistance to Palada that growers can grow, and again, to understand more about Palada's biology and, and parasitism in this environment. And then regulation, similar to New York, is an APHIS effort in, in cooperation with state entities. And they actually do run the eradication program that's currently um, active in Idaho. And just an example of some of the integrated eradication strategies that the group has been looking at. Uh, again, Solanum sesimbrifolium, we're pretty interested in that in Idaho. Biological agents, uh, biofumigants, um, and then globular genomics and population genetics. Program successes, over half a million soil samples have been processed uh, by USDA AFS. Um, egg viability in infested fields has been reduced by 95% through soil fumigation. Eight infested fields have passed the bioassay phase of the regulation process, and this is a big deal. So these fields were fumigated, we monitor, or they monitor um, egg viability uh, with hatching assays, and then they go, these soil samples go onto potato plants that's conducted by Louise Marie's lab, and once it's shown that there are no viable cysts in these samples, they can leave regulation and then go into a different aspect of the program. And there's an active Globidera Palata research program in the United States. All right, last one, Globidera elingtonae. And that's the one that I've been working on for the past five years. So the history of that, uh, discovery in 2008. Again, this is kind of this, you know, um, two parallel universe type thing because actually the, the find of Globidera elingtonae in Oregon and Idaho were independent of each other. So the find in Idaho of two fields that had Globidera elingtonae was part of a survey that was initiated after the find of Palada in that tear soil. Okay, so a big, huge effort happened in the United States to further delimit where Globidera was in the country, and this included Idaho and many other states. So it was found in two fields in Idaho, and actually they returned to these fields and weren't able to find any more cysts. So that's kind of 
They found four cysts total from two of these fields. In Oregon, it was a little bit different. So the, the nematode was found on an Oregon State Research Facility that was actually the, the, um, the home of the tri-state breeding, potato breeding program in the Pacific Northwest. Soil samples were taken as part of a certification process to move potatoes off that area to an inter international source, and they found Globidera elantone in those samples. Um, I became part of this project in 2010. Oh, oops, excuse me. We demonstrated that potato and tomato are, um, are hosts for the nematode, and at that time, Oregon State voluntarily shut that facility to all research. So the potato breeding program has been moved to a different place in Oregon, and this research site, which is shown down here, it's about a 40-acre farm, um, has essentially just become our Globadera research facility. Um, Zafar Handu and the folks at the nematology lab at USDA ARS elevated it to a new species in 2012. And again, I really want to point out that as compared to Rostockiensis and Pallida, this is not a regulated pathogen in the United States. All right, just briefly a little bit about um, the description and some of the biological features of this nematode. Our goal over the past five years is to kind of understand how Ellingtone is similar to or different from the other Globidera species. So this is the um, original description of the nematode here that was done by the group in Beltsville. Um, as part of that paper, there were a few uh, single gene phylogenies using ITS region, HSP90, uh, that showed that on a molecular level, Globidera Ellingtone is also distinct from Pallida and Rostockiensis. Uh, my postdoc, Wendy Phillips, took this a little bit further and did a multi-gene phylogeny um, with some of the genomic data that we had. And here's Ellingtone. It's more closely related to Rostockiensis and Tabacum, and, more dist and they're all more distantly related to Globidera pallida. So this continuing to reinforce the phylogeny of this nematode in relationship to its uh, relatives. Um, initially, we, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of cysts. We had a little, we had a hot spot that had about, I believe, seven to 24 cysts per kilogram of soil. So we kind of had to go to this little area that was about 30 feet by 10 feet. And we took nematodes from there and we increased them. So initially, the best thing that we could do was do um, hatching assays um, that, have, that you've seen in the literature. Um, and so we did this in addition to field observations later to look at the hatching dynamics of this nematode. And this is that classic um, figure that people have seen before, and it's called the pallida problem. And the problem with pallida is it has a very prolonged hatch. So if you apply nematocytes, oftentimes the amount of nematocyte is very low when these nematodes actually, actually hatch. Well, that's not the case for Ellingtonia. We observe that hatch is pretty rapid. Actually, in the lab, we can see a 90% hatch in about three days. Um, so more similar to what's reported in the literature for Globidera rostockiensis. And then the inset here is some of the data that we collected from the field, looking at J2 populations in soil over time. This line and the dotted blue line are the occurrence of J2s in soil. So you see we get early season hatch. And we also see what is being reported in the literature which, uh, with a late J2 hatch that's also seen with Pallida and Rostockiensis. Um, some really good data that we got very early was if Ellingtone is found somewhere else in the United States, we do have a way to deal with this nematode similar to the way they're dealing with Rostockiensis here in Quebec and also in New York, and that's the use of resistance. So we looked at uh, several potato varieties uh, from the Pacific Northwest, as well as three varieties that have the H1 gene, which confers resistance to R01 pathotype of Rostockiensis. And you can clearly see here that these varieties are were also resistant to Globidera ellingtoni. We've expanded this effort. We work now with the uh, plant breeder at New York, and a lot of the material that he sends us that's resistance to R01 is also resistant to ellingtoni. So there is a resistance gene out there. And again, you think back to the phylogeny, and that kind of supports the closer relationship of ellingtoni with Rostockiensis as opposed to Pallida. Okay, finally, um, on Globidera Ellingtone, a big thing that we've done over the last four years is to understand about the pathogenicity of this nematode on potato. We've conducted four years of field trials. Uh, essentially, we go in and we inoculate potatoes with different initial densities of the nematode, anywhere from zero to 360 eggs per gram of soil. If you look at the literature, 
you know, you get reports of five acres per gram of soil being damaging for Pallida and Rostock Kansas. So we certainly were inoculating within a range of densities where you would expect to see an impact on potato. And my, my caption here, minimal impacts of Globetera Ellingtoni on yield of potato, is that we have never seen, I mean, I personally don't work with Pallida and Rostock Kansas. I can't. We can't bring those nematodes into the state of Oregon. But if you look at the literature, you look at the pictures, we never saw the same kind of impact on potato that were observed in other locations. So here's an example of our field trial. These potatoes are inoculated with the different initial densities. They all look the same to me. They don't have that classic kind of collapsing look that you'll see with uh, potatoes that are heavily impacted by Globadera. Some of the data, uh, 2013, we looked at Russet Burbank, Desiree, 2014, Russet Burbank again, and then 2015, Russet Ranger. And all you need to look at here um, is that our, our p-values in two of the years, we had a significant reduction in a yield of potato. Um, in this case, it was this 80 eggs per gram of soil that pulled that line down, and in this case, the 360 eggs per gram of soil. And then two years, we saw no impact of this nematode on potato yield. So this kind of has led us just to say that Globadera Ellingtonae in Oregon at Powell Butte, which is where the field site is, is a minimal pathogen of potato. And again, just some pictures to reiterate this. Uh, this is this past year, a potato plant with zero eggs per gram of soil, 360 eggs per gram of soil early in the season, no obvious differences. And then an eight week old potato that has 360 eggs per gram of soil. Okay, so that's it for the overview of Globadera in the United States. Um, all of this activity combined um, kind of, you know, meant Louise Marie and I were talking and we were like, oh yeah, we want to, you know, make our lives difficult, so let's write a big grant, okay? <laughs> and we got funded. So this is, um, we call ourselves Global, which is the Globadera Alliance. Uh, we are a five-year, uh, $3.2 million USDA NEFA-funded project. We were funded through what's called the Coordinated Agriculture Project. Uh, very few of these are funded each year, and usually the the focus of these CAP grants shifts from year to year, depending on what NEFA is looking for. Um, we have several institutions involved. Um, the project is led by Louise Marie and the University of Idaho. We're very fortunate to have international partners um, on our project because, obviously, if you look back at the history of Globadera in the United States, we don't have a lot of, of, of history with these nematodes. So to have our international partners be able to bring a lot of knowledge to the table for us has truly been a great thing for us. Um, so additionally, we have Cornell University, Oregon State University, D. Denver is here, James Hutton Institute, um, you'll hear Vivian speak, um, INRA in France, you'll hear Eric speak uh, later um, in the day, uh, USDA, ARS in New York, Oregon, and Idaho are involved, and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, our local arrangements, Benjamin Mimi is also involved in this effort. So here are all our investigators, nematologists, plant breeders, extension specialists. That's our group. Oh, and an economist right there. Uh, we also have an advisory board, so we work very closely with federal and state regulators, with Potato Commission representatives from across the country. We have John Pickup from SASA here as well. He's on our advisory board. So the goal here is to meet with these folks regularly and to get direction in our project and make sure that we're addressing the needs of the industry as well as regulators and scientists. We have four specific goals. Uh, develop genomic approaches for risk assessment of Globadera, and this pretty much revolves around population genetics and more a better understanding of virulence. So if a population is found somewhere in the United States in the future, can we have more data on, from a genomic level, of how virulent this population is? Um, so that's the idea there. Plant breeding for enhanced uh, potato resistance, and as I said before, we have resistance to Rostockiensis in commercially acceptable varieties for New York potato growers. We do not have that for Idaho potato growers. So really, our holy grail is a russeted type potato with resistance to pallida. Um, is what we we won't reach that in five years, but certainly, hopefully, we have enough uh, genetic resources to move that further down the road. Enhanced stakeholder engagement, knowledge, and action related to Globadera. Um, you, talk, you talk to growers in Idaho and they really feel like they're isolated. You know, you, they feel like the rest of the industry has pretty much says that's your problem, that's not our problem. And if you looked at the economics of the impact of Palada in Idaho, it is more than just 
a Southeast Idaho issue. It's an Idaho problem and it's a U.S. potato problem. So that's what we try to communicate with our project. And then develop educational programs uh, using Globidera as an invasive plant pathogen model is another goal of our project. So here's one of those figures that you have to make for a NEFA grant, right? To show all the connectiveness of your project. And uh, so, you know, we're gonna touch on all of these and they're all interrelated and they all are gonna add to our risk model on Globidera in the United States, as well as educating growers and, um, and policy makers about Globidera in the United States. So a little bit about um, some of the output of our, of our program. Um, yearly, we, we talk with um, Idaho potato growers. Uh, we have extension presentations um, in, in Spanish and English, uh, publications and demonstrations. We're trying to engage the growers. Um, outreach, we have a quarterly uh, newsletter um, and that is both in English and Spanish. We have a website, if you'd like to visit our website, and actually these presentations will probably be uploaded on the website, much to Vivian's <laughs> delight. <laughs> um, and we are uh, training the next generation of experts in Globadera. I believe there's four to five graduate students currently on this project, a couple postdocs, um, undergraduates, um, so we're doing that as well. And my last slide, some conclusions. I hope I've demonstrated that limiting the spread of PCN is, is of the utmost importance, not only for U.S. Potato, potato but globally. Um, and again, to reiterate, I think the U.S. has done a phenomenal job of, of restricting those introductions to very small areas in the United States. Um, the U.S. has approached this through federal and state partnerships that have been extremely successful. We have a 60-year history with Globadera Rostockiensis in New York that has been very successful and the Palata program should be no different as we move forward in the future. Consequences on global trade are real. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have another introduction and have more foreign markets close to your potatoes. Um, and that was reality for the United States when Palata was found in 2006. And um, I think you'll hear from uh, some of the speakers after me in the symposium that resistance really is the key. You know, it, the, the growers in Southeast Idaho would be a lot better off if we had a russeted type potato with resistance to palata that they could incorporate into their eradication program. There's our logo, there's our website if you wanna visit it. And with that, thank you very much. So the question is, why do we worry about Globidera elantone that doesn't cause crop loss? Um, it's risk and perception again. It's, it's not a regulated pest by the U.S. government, but I think we could all argue that we don't want to see a, a cis nematode spread. 
It's hard. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very hard question to answer because inherently there's risk because of its close association with Pallida and Rostockiensis, despite the fact that we haven't found it to be a pathogen in a single location. I guess that's where the risk is. I don't know how Ellingtonia is going to behave in other environments. <laughs> One last question. In the, uh, in the uh, management program in New York, are they using the same um, sampling scheme as they do in Europe? No. No. No, they, they use a much uh, more stringent sampling scheme.